Next up is Carolyn Purnell. Carolyn is Visiting Assistant Professor and Postdoctoral Fellow in the Benjamin Franklin Project at the Illinois Institute of Technology. She received her PhD from the University of Chicago. She's a past recipient of the Natalie Zeman Davis Graduate Student Paper Award presented by French Historical Studies. And she's the author of the book forthcoming from Norton, Enlightened Bodies, The Cat Piano, Iguanodon Diners, and Other Stimulating Episodes in Sensory History. She's currently working on a new project entitled Sensible Instruments, Remaking Society Through the Body in the French Enlightenment. Her paper today is Drinking Your Way to a New You, Self-Medication, Sensibility, and Sociability at the Café. Carolyn? Thank you. In the 17th century, there was no shortage of establishments in which one could drink. Taverns, cabarets, inns, and gonguettes dotted the urban landscape, offering refreshment to patrons of all ilk. But as the century progressed, many of these establishments gained a reputation for violence and immorality. In August 1647, Marchand de Vin, Hôtelier, and Cabaretier were forbidden to sell beer, cider, and other unseemly beverages. Unfortunately for vendors, these restrictions emerged at the same time that the court and the haute bourgeoisie had begun tickling their tongues with the sweet, spicy, and exotic beverages that had trickled into France from its colonial territories. Unwilling to miss out on financial success, certain enterprising fellows formed the Limonadier Guild in 1673, and the guild received its statutes from Louis XIV in 1676. While these shops later came to be called cafes, coffee was by no means the only beverage sold. The statutes of the guild granted Limonadier the right to buy, sell, and make all, quote, refreshing beverages, which included brandy, liqueurs, tea, chocolate, vanilla, imported specialty wines, lemonade, jellies, ices, coffee, and candied fruits. During the 18th century, the Limonadier's Guild came to be one of the richest, and actually Mercier describes how even the shop boys lived as princes. And the demand for their goods was so high that the market seemed almost insatiable. There were many reasons for the desirability of these new spaces, including, but not limited to, novelty, taste, and entertainment, but their historical significance has centered on their popularity as sites for new forms of sociability. Jürgen Habermas famously described the emergence of the public sphere, which was carved out by new commercial relationships facilitated by the rise of capitalism. Helpful as his theories are, his scope was so expansive that it didn't account for the symbolic content or physiology attached to particular goods. Limonadier's shops were more than simply a space conducive to holding bodies, and their products were not value neutral. These spaces fostered new forms of sociability not only because of the type of setting that they offered, but also because of the goods that were sold there. We know that caffeine, sugar, and related substances are stimulants, so it comes as no surprise to us why individuals unaccustomed to their effects might have seen them as powerful medicinal or intellectual aids. And it's not too much of a stretch to understand why Jules Michelet described coffee as a, quote, sober liquor, powerfully cerebral, which augments clarity and lucidity. But stimulation was not all that consumers expected from Limonadier's wares. Because of traditional Galenic medical tenets and the rise of the discourse of sensibility in which the mind, morals, and body were intimately and reciprocally connected, all kinds of non-naturals had the power to affect one's temperament, sociability, and character. For example, Limonadier advertised the Eau de Melis de Carme, which was a citronella grass liqueur originally manufactured in the 17th century by Parisian Carmelite monks. And they advertised it as a beverage that had, quote, the power to excite the memory, dissipate melancholy, and ward off hypochondria, an illness that was associated with, quote, extravagant and bizarre men. <laughs> Women were encouraged to drink orange flower water to keep their nerves in check, and lemon-flavored beverages were recommended to ease, quote, wounded imaginations, <laughs> whatever that means. <laughs> Producers were often quite conscious of the potential medical effects of their wares, and many Limonadier advertised these effects in newspapers, trade manuals, or treatises. Numerous legal disputes took place over particular beverages when purveyors of medical ingredients argued that Limonadier were encroaching on their territory and vice versa. And after the formation of the Société Royale de Médecine in the 1770s, Limonadier's beverages, most notably liqueurs and chocolates, frequently featured among the products submitted for the society's approval. The lines between luxury consumption, physical health, and social and psychological well-being were especially blurred in the case of Limonadrie. So to provide one example, in 1727, the traveler Joachim Christoph Nemitz recounted a story in which he revealed the immense powers of coffee. And this is a quotation. It is reckoned that coffee is a good remedy to chase away melancholy. 
According to a certain lady, it's claimed that this was an illustrious duchess from Paris, whose name I won't divulge here out of respect, who, learning that her husband was killed in a battle, cried, Ah, oh, how unhappy I am. Quick, quick, somebody bring me coffee. <laughs> the Limonadier shop, as a site that... <laughs> The Limonadier's shop, as a site that sold a panoply of consumable options, offered a similarly wide range of potential selves to customers. In the cafe, one could actively engineer oneself through the products that one chose to consume. Thanks to a widespread, widespread belief in the immediate connection between body and mind, many 18th century consumers chose their beverages based on social traits, personal characteristics, or feelings that they wanted to enhance. Certainly, consumers did not drink solely for medicinal purposes, but Limonadier's wares served double duty as medicine and recreational commodities, and these over-the-counter temperament enhancers reveal a great deal about early cafe goers. The medical aspects of cafe consumption make clear that the cafe offered a site for altering sociability, and indeed society itself, on a deep physical and moral level. Notably, consumers often made note of the social ben benefits that would result from their improved temperaments, transferring the scope of individual health to a collective scale. Ultimately, it was the intermixture of individual physiological considerations, commerce, and social space that made the Limonadier shop such an ideal site for the emergence of the public sphere. <laughs>